God, yay! James and James, Daily Freak Show! Wow! Freak Show, Freak, freak Show. She's a kind of girl that you find out in the lonely bar. Yeah, she's a kind of girl that you find out in the lonely bar. I am sitting here with the legendary, and I, I know I throw that word around a lot, but really, with the one, the only, the most, the magnificent Jane County. How are you, honey? Well, thank you. I'm absolutely fantastic, besides being hot as hell. It is. It's about 110 outside, uh, and, and we're melting. And that's why I don't have that big wig on. It's just too hot to put the wig on. You have to go along with the natural, my natural. Your, your natural seafoam hair. My naturally blue hair. <laughs> uh, so now let's. I want to. I want to talk to people about. I want to go through all the old, uh, the old stuff again. I, a, a quick Wikipedia search of you right, <laughs> showed me that you were at Stonewall the night that it ri that the riots happened. Well, so, some people don't know that. I guess I was at Stonewall all three nights. I was on my way to the Stonewall, and the riots were starting, and, and then I and Jim. Jim Ferret was in the, in the, you know, in it and everything. And I didn't know who he was and anything. And I was no one but a little street queen back then. And uh, we ended up somehow marching back and forth down Christopher Street, going, "Gay power, gay power, gay power." And we'd get to one end and we'd look around, and go, "I don't know what to do now." <laughs> well, go back the other way. Gay power, gay power, gay power. So yeah, I was I was there all three nights. Did it feel to you like the, the, that it was a, a turning point? Did it feel like you were in part of history right then, or, it, it, or is that in retrospect? You know. You know what? I kind of did. I think feel it's part of history because I'm I'm very his I'm sort of a historian myself. I love history. I've studied history, ancient, current, all kinds of history. I'm a history buff, mm -hmm. and so I did have an inkling that this is, had to be this, something this something, something new, something different happened. Yeah, here. something something new, something something different, and something that was uh, needed. You know, gay people standing up for themselves was well needed because, you know, I was a little teenager in the early '60s, and you know, we had to know how to run. Right. You know, we, we got chased by rednecks, and we had to carry two pair of shoes in our first one to walk <laughs> in, one to run in, and. Um, those were the days where the, the pol in Georgia the police would pick you up and take you down to the down to the cell and shave your head. So we had to learn how to hide behind trees and everything like that. So looking back on that uh, during the Stonewall riots, I knew that was some kind of historical occurrence. Definitely was. Now, were you at that time? Were you a rebel? Were you were you causing trouble? Were you kicking up your heels wherever you went, or were you? Did, did, was that the beginning of? of I have always caused trouble. I have been accused so many times of being a troublemaker, and I am guilty as charged. Sometimes I have learned to behave myself a little more now in my, uh, uh, I don't want to say older years, but, <laughs> but time marches on. <laughs> um, even as a little kid, I caused trouble in school. I used to cause horrible things to happen to my school teachers. Everywhere I went, I just stirred up trouble. I, for some reason, I enjoy seeing people squabble and argue and fight. But because actually, that is the way you get progress. You don't have any progress unless unless people squabble and fight about it. You know, squeaky wheel gets the gets yeah. the. Yeah. That, that's right. And I, and I and I and I love getting people in in debate and all that. You know, and just out and out fist fights really. <laughs> so now, it, so this is the late sixties of Stonewall, and then you were in one of the proto punk bands, um, with the Queen. What well, Queen? Well, well, they they were called Queen Elizabeth. They, Queen Elizabeth, the, right? But they were not named after the Queen of the Queen of England. They were named after a drag queen in Atlanta, Georgia, who worked for Rich's Department Store, and she they thought she was a woman. And she was actually modeling clothes for people, and and she was they thought she was this woman. Well, one of the people that worked for Rich's department store happened to just barge into the dressing room, just as Miss and Queen Elizabeth was pulling her, her girl team. up, Aww. and there it was, oh, and it was right. like, oh my God! So Queen Elizabeth, she was fired from her job, but of course she was famous with all the Atlanta queens. Oh, she was so a big big star in the in, in the whole gay scene in Atlanta. So then, so at this point you're still Wayne, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then tell me about the emergence of Jane, and tell me about uh, uh, when you was this both Jane when you moved to London? When was and that was during the punk scene? But, the, but, but so give me give me the chronology, the chronology here. Well, you know, okay. Uh, I'll make it brief in a way that okay. I was walking down the street in Atlanta with a friend, and we were shot at by rednecks. They were shooting at us, and uh, I turned around to her and said, "I'm getting the hell out of here." 
So I got $25 together, got on a Greyhound bus, and went back to New York City. Went to New York City, I'm, and I never looked back. This was 72? Oh, this was 68. Oh, okay, okay. 68. And then I went home for a while, then I came back in 69, and then I, did, I never went back home for like, you know, 25 years. Um, and uh, the first thing I did was hang out at the Stonewall in Christopher Street, and I used to go to the sewer, too. That thing was is famous now, and that's where I met Lee Black Childers and lots of people, and that's where we were hanging out on the stoops, and we we saw Jackie and Candy walking and down. We're the in um, Jackie's play. Yeah, well, we met Jackie and Candy on the street, really, and then uh, I moved in Jackie with Curtis. Of Candy, oh, I'm sorry. Jackie Curtis and Candy Darling. Well, I moved in with Lee Black Childers because I needed a place to live, and then. Uh, Lee started going to Max's and photographing everyone. He went to Jackie's wedding and photographed Jackie. And Jackie had a fight with John Bacaro, and so Jackie moved in with us. So along with Jackie came all of her, all of her uh, following: Rita Red, uh, Rio Grande, uh, uh, Dusty Springs. She had all these little boys following her around, and they all moved in with me and Lee on 13th Street. And it was like a, it was like a 24-hour circus because everyone was on a different drug. You know, Jackie, Curtis, Jackie was getting up and putting speed in her coffee and riding page and page after plays and plays and plays. Nodding out. And then you had the junkies on the floor nodding out. And then you had Miss Pilfrey, who is one of my best friends in the world, and I love her, the, the incredible Miss Holly Woodlong. Oh, so can you imagine me and Lee and Rita Red and Jackie Curtis and Holly Woodlong all living in one cold water flat in the East Village in 1969? Well, this is what, this is what I can never understand because it seems to me that the world was smaller back then because everybody, the, the scene was so small that everybody knew everybody, and you lived with Lee and you, you lived with Holly, and, and then you were in, you know, Jackie. The, well, the, 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 the back room of Max is where the gathering place. It was like a, it was like a watering hole. Mm-hmm. All the different creatures, all the different animals would come up to the watering hole to get water. Max just was the back, and the back room was where all the freaks converged and met. As as, as had, like people from the Rothschilds and and people with with fil- filthy money. I mean, just incredible bits of money. Yeah, and Bowie and yeah, Stein. yeah. But they were in, but hanging out with you know low life drug dealers and and people throwing up from quail too many quaaludes and stuff and all mixed in together and it was quite strange really right right no, but it sounds it sounds like everybody it, it, you don't have that sense of community anymore i don't no, no no more i mean i don't think there will never be another back room of max's where every type of person just kind of met and and, and they actually got along if you can call that getting along because you never walked. debbie was debbie harry was the waitress debbie was a waitress for years she was a waitress there a lot of people started out there and uh, the one thing about the back room of max is when you left it you you never turned your back you didn't walk out of the back room you backed out <laughs> because, because, because the queens you were turn your back they would throw daggers at you oh. just, they were just oh. waiting for you to leave so they could start on you well, now was there a sense of of underground celebrity at that point was th- so there was a hierarchy there there was a hierarchy there was the underground stars like Jackie Curtis there was where were you on that at that time well I started out as just uh, hanging out and uh, do, I was doing my art I was doing Egyptian art for people and then uh, I uh, appeared in one of Jackie's plays and then I graduated to like you know un- underground theater person uh, and you know because you had all those pl- theater the ridiculous pl- uh, right. ridiculous hanging out at Max's too like Ruby Lynn Rayner and all those people in Penny Arcade and I love uh, Penny I still love Penny she's yeah, great uh, Penny's, uh, Penny's a fantastic person yeah and then um, I went for because I've always been into rock and roll music and stuff and I always um, uh, went to the Fillmore East to see, you know, everybody from Led Zeppelin to the Iron Butterfly to the Kinks. And so I wanted to mix the theater with the music. So uh, these other people, Johnny and Tommy Marcus, who went on to become the Miamis and they're on the CBGB's record, they were in Jackie Curtis's play Femme Fatale. And I was in Femme Fatale and I played a lesbian prison inmate who, who uh, ate flies. Okay. And Typecasting. I, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, Typecasting. It's my debut on the New York stage, and I had a, a, a plastic shit under my dress with a rubber band, and I my opening uh, opening lines were: I jumped out on the stage and I put my hand under my dress and brought out this plastic shit and went, "Oh my God, you scared the shit out of me." Tacky as can be, but that was my moment. That was my. That was your debut into New York society. The New York society. Yeah. Um, mm. Uh-huh. Yeah. So then uh, you go to London. Well, I, 
I formed Queen Elizabeth with some of the people, some of the musicians that were in the Jackie Curtis's play in for town. And so um, I formed a band, Queen Elizabeth, and we, you know, performed all over New York and everywhere, and we got the attention of David Bowie's main man management. Oh, and, they, and they invested in you. Yeah, they managed me for a little while and everything. And at that time, they had Danny Gillespie, and they were working for Iggy Pop at that time as well. And also Johnny Cougar, who went on to become John Mellencamp. That's very strange. Stop it. Really? Yeah, his first album was oh. on Main Man. That's very Did you ever sleep with John Cougar? No, I never stopped. I don't eat him on my type. Uh-huh. He seemed like he's too, his body is like. He's a little short, stubby, like a little compact. It was compressed, like uh. something started here and something started there and it went like that. I don't know. <laughs> no offense. Uh-huh. Um, and then I got, you know, and then I formed my, my band called the Backstreet Boys. Can you believe that? In 1973, 74, I had... We're playing games with my heart. Oh, God. No, no. no they're not those Backstreet Boys, uh, eventually. Uh, uh, I had a, my own band called... I would the, love to see you with the Backstreet Boys. Yeah, yeah me too. I'm sure they would love it. But uh, I had my band called the Backstreet Boys, and I got the name from... The Susan Hayward movie, Backstreet. Oh, right, okay, yeah. yeah. The Backstreet Boy. And we got just got a lot of attention, and then from there, you know, uh, I went to London on my own with my guitar player, and we formed the electric, electric chairs. Now, that's when I, in Saginaw, Michigan, 14 years old, I had that yellow copy, yeah. that, uh, the yellow, um, it was like oh, a special the, one. The, 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 yeah, of the, of the of the best of not time. Oh, the uh, the best of album, or you had the EP. I think it was the best of. Yeah, it would it fuck had, off on it. Had, um, uh, I like toilet love. Oh, you yes, like toilet. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Nighttime toilet love. Mean motherfucking man. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. The- and li- it, that was like I've, I've told you this before that you got me through high school. Oh my and You God. got like I know I was the only person in Michigan who had and, and I sat there and every night I would say there's there are people out there like me. There are people out there that will understand me someday. And you were that shining light. Oh. Thank you. I heard people say they had to hide my records in the bottom of their underwear drawer from their mothers. Oh, see, I would play it really loud just to upset my mom. You know, that was my rebellion. Oh, I, I would play, fuck, you know, if you don't want to fuck me, baby. And she would turn that music down and she'd cry and cry. She cried? Uh, oh. I was, you know, I was the troubled child. That was not really pounding her over the head. That oh. song is so filthy. <laughs> you don't want to take a walk with me on my meat rack. Get the hell out of my bread line. That's a filthy song. That's one of the first songs of that type that was so filthy. But now that's nothing. Now everything, shit, motherfucker, shit, fuck, fuck, yeah, yeah, uh uh-huh, motherfucker, shit, yeah. Everything like that. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about some of the, the, the boundary or the, the things, the, the barriers that you broke. And you were the first transsexual in rock. You were one of the first. Um, it was doing real rock and roll, I, I, I would say, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, there, there was like New York Dolls and stuff like that, but you took it to a whole I, other level. Yeah, I took it to another level. There was the, there was the, uh, the New York Dolls, and the, which were really a, a, a bunch of little straight boys dressing up and pretending, really. But I mean, they, the real thing. yeah, and I was the real thing, and that's, that's what freaked out. I was the real thing, and Joe Bryce came along. Joe Bryce was the real thing, too, and we both got a lot of shit, you know, for that. Well, but Sharon, Joe Bryce, uh, Joe Bryce uh, the, my song, Man enough to be a woman, uh, Joe Bryant actually gave me the idea to write that song. So you knew Joe Bryant? Oh yeah, I knew Joe Bryant. We sat uh, in Max's and booths and all, and one night we were sitting together and we were talking about all the kind of expressions that you know the, uh, in, in, on the gay scene, you know, from where we were from, like you know, old ones like Rose, get over yourself and stuff like that. Everything, you know, and he had and everything to like, oh yeah, sure, I'm a man, man enough to be a woman like that. And I said that would make a great song. He said. You should do that. You should you, ha- you should have a song, Man Enough to Be a Woman. I said, I will. So I wrote Man Enough to Be a Woman. And Joe Bryant gave me the idea that I should do that. Well, now, because as Sharon was just saying, um, she just had a really great quote about how, you know, at, at the time that, like, you know, punk rock was shaking things up and you were shaking up punk rock. Do you think that you got respect at that time? Did you get shit? What, was, what, was, what were people's reactions to you in the punk rock scene? A, a little of both. I mean, they, they were the the people who who you know really either loved me or the people who were absolutely horrified. You know, even even you know scared of me. You know, and um, uh, I remember that's power that to, to have that power over yeah. those types of people. Uh, I, I remember when I did my song shit and I and I pretended to shit on the toilet and I dipped down in the toilet and brought out Elpo dog food and people thought it was real shit and because I even I'm not 
you know, I, I'm not going to mess with real shit. I'm sorry. Please, art, 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 Alpo dog food. And But people freaked out, and people would run out holding their heads going, no, no, this this is too much. This is not acceptable. No, uh-uh. I won't go for this. No, this is too much. You know, And this is after like an hour of me fucking myself with a, 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 a rubber pussies and double-headed dildos and masturbating, uh, masturbating myself with the statue of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> And we got a gun pulled on us in Rhode Island because I was, you know, and, and this person was screaming, was screaming, she, I don't know if it's he or she or whatever, is, 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 is blaspheming God, he's masturbating with the Virgin Mary, you know, and all of a sudden we hear, pow, bang, 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 a gun. Well, so, so you were the, the original Marilyn Manson. I guess, I guess yeah. yeah, in a lot of ways I was. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and sort of like, you know, in all the outrage at the time over Alice Cooper and Kiss and stuff like that, but that was silly a little. I, that was... I took it really to a point where no one else was taking it. But you had to do that in order to... It, it was commercial suicide, but I didn't care because I was one of those people that didn't care. I did it because I loved it and liked it and, and felt I should be doing it. I really wasn't saying, I'm going to become a pop star and make money. That was the furthest thing from my mind. I just At the moment, I was just doing what I wanted to do, shake things up. Because I've always been a wrecker. When I was a screaming queen in Atlanta, we walked through the, walked through the streets wrecking people, you know, saying things outrageous, dressing outrageous, making people point and scream and go, oh my God, look at that. It's called wrecking. So I, and so I just took the wrecking into my music, and, I, and to this day, I still love to wreck people. Do you, do you ever think that, that perhaps, uh, in retrospect, that maybe you should have had one eye on the money? I think that all the time. I think maybe I should have had one eye on the on the dollar sign, uh, but then I but then it wouldn't have been then me. Have been, I, been then true. I wouldn't have the history that I I have. It would have been totally different, you know, totally different. I mean, and the the recordings that I did, you know, I make a I get my roles. The the record yeah. company are very nice. I get my royalties from the selling. Of it, I get great royalty checks and things. So you know, I did all right. I, I'm not a big rich pop star, but I don't really you care. But you have a place. You have, and, and you get. I made my place. Yeah, yeah, and and, and you were know, true to yourself. And, and I was, you know, true to myself. Now there were times when I tried to do other things I shouldn't have did because somebody talked me into it. But basically, I remain like Sharon Needles talking you into oh, this shit. Yeah. No, people every once in a while saying, oh, you should do dance music, and me going, and they're going, oh, I don't want to do dance music, it's not my thing, and they talk me into it, and then I do it and embarrass myself, <laughs> and if anyone says to me ever again, you should do dance music, I'm going to kill them. Yeah, here, Sharon, come sit down for one second. Oh, we, the gorgeous Miss Sharon Needles. Hi, I love you, darling. Thank you so much for having me. the pod. Pity the pod. Pity the pod. <laughs> These were not pod people, darling. We were just talking a second ago about idols and icons and, and making your place in the world and being a big, loud, you know, stomping around and getting attention. Wrecking people, wrecking, wrecking people. people. Wrecking. Uh, I, it, it feels like you two are on the sa sa opposite ends of the same stick, you know? Right, right. Um, when we get together and talk, you can't believe it. It's all of a sudden, it's like there's one brain there. <laughs> and she's great. I can call her at like 2 in the morning, and she always picks up the phone, yeah, and we just talk girl, for hours. She's a great girl. drinking. She's a great... Uh, phone drink. I said, oh, wait a minute, girl, let me go get a bottle of wine with you, and I drink it slug and we're on the phone, going, really? So you, you both just sit and get wasted on the yeah, phone together. Phone. Yeah. Four in the morning. Oh, by, by See, phone. I, I always consider, like, Jane must already be dead because I'm a, reca I'm a reincarnation. Oh, reincarnation right? Of the so there's, spirit. like, some time schism happening that does allow you both to exist at the there same time? There must be some kind, of, some kind of quandrum in time. There's some sort of wormhole that you've that entered that one yeah. is, you're, you're both allowed to exist. Finally, our, t our dimension has come into one, maybe. Uh -huh. I don't know. I was so nervous the first time I met Jane. I was just like, oh, God, I was just, she's just so legendary. And, like, the second I met her, it was just like, bam, we clicked. And, and I know I play stupid on TV, but um, but I read a lot. And, like, you know, I've gushed over, of course, Disco Bloodbath, your book. But Man Enough to Be a Woman, her book was huge life no, change. Yeah, life. exactly. It, it was like reading my own life story in, in, in another in another plane of reality, you know, and just like it's, it's in the it's in the canon. It, it belongs uh, yeah. Right. And and the and the young like gay kids today, they just they, they need to know what the struggle, the history and how fucking fantastic they don't know the history. Yeah, the, the, they, and they need to realize how fantastic like underground like queer music and movement was. Well, the, yeah, cuz there really aren't underground movements anymore. Because because everything gets immediately sucked up by the internet and spread over a million people. So nothing has a chance to gestate or, you know, bubble up, yeah, you that's know? True. Oh, that's true. There's no bubbling up anymore. It's all of a sudden like, wham, bam. Yeah, you will never have a, a, a Max's Kansas City or, or CBGB's where everything...
interesting. Years yeah, where it takes no, years of floating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jane, did you That's realize I wore my Max's Kansas City T-shirt for oh you my today? God, Again. it's an original. But tell me a little bit about what you're doing with. with Take the, take oh, yes, yes. Um, well, um, you know, my album, uh, it's, it's a real conceptual album, and there's no filler songs on it. Every single album, every song in this album to me feels like a single, an experience, and, um, and, it's, and it's really uh, uh, eclectic. With Jane, I would never ask her to do um, a dance track or a club track with me. Uh, she tried that in the early 90s, and it was fucking terrible. Your music was god-awful when you made those uh, electronic records. You should fucking be ashamed of yourself. You, the punk, the punk gods well, will piss on you for that. Damn it, Jane! You really but, fucked up. But um, they're all dead. Those people, I killed them all. Right, right. But um, uh, me and me and Jane. One of them are dead. Right, right, right. Well, it's it's all my almost my idols are dead too. That's why filling this album up with guest stars was uh, like impossible. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, but so me and Jane are uh, doing a, a punk um, uh, track together. It's called Hail Satan. Um, and it's it's all about it's all about how valley girls say oh my god all the time. But me and Jane, um, we're not valley girls. We're we're, uh, we're we're mountain monsters, and uh, we don't reside in the valley. We we scream from the mountaintop. So that, so we say hell Satan, and uh, a lot, and it's and it's it's uh, I don't know. It's pretty much about hell. And the devil's making us. Yeah, yeah. Basically, we made a deal with the devil. Yeah. We're giving him his beyond. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Satanist. But I just think um, I, I think the devil is just funner than God. The more interesting than God. I can't keep white clean. I don't belong in heaven. More open and the devil's more accepting than God. God wants to punish you every time you turn around. Right. The devil's going, there she goes. Yeah, the devil's going, go for it, girl. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen? No, right there. We're just running out. We're running out. Okay. So, and it, I love you, darling. I love you too, baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love you. Mm -hmm. Good I luck, good luck, you. darling. Mm -hmm. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Anyway, we gotta get Armin Raw. Right. <laughs> She's the kind of girl that wonder who she is. Then she tells you who you are. Dancing like a queen in her high heel shoes with her fingernails. 